This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. And Heidi, I mean, we're just a few seconds out from the start of trade for Japan and South Korea. But the focus today really coming through from those numbers on Wall Street. We had Meta, Amazon, Apple, all these putting out some pretty mixed outlooks. But the weakness really in those Apple numbers on China. Yeah, and the surprise coming from Meta, right, that outperformance. We also had strong profit growth at uh, Amazon that's expected to continue. But you said it, it's really the weakness out of Apple. Is this just really kind of the concern over the China slowdown? Or are there broader concerns over demand for the iPhone? But certainly uh, we'll be watching those Apple suppliers uh, in these sessions. Yeah, absolutely. And you can't, of course, forget the earnings that are underway in Asia. And we did have Japanese lenders on the docket. But Japan just coming online here. And as I said, uh, really at the start, it's the market reaction that we're coming through on those big tech numbers from the US. So Apple, you can see there that drop in after hours, as we said, that weakness from China overshadowing actually some more positive things that came out, including a sales beat. And then you've got Meta as well, uh, rising nearly 15% in late trade. And that was after its first quarter revenue outlook top to estimates the focus as well on that dividend because it's the first time ever we've seen one of those being issued from the company in Japan today, that's really going to be playing into the session because you are seeing the Nikkei here posting some gains. The S&P 500 as well up more than 1% in the session. So just reversing some of those losses earlier in the week. Uh, what else we're tracking in the session, as I said, are these lenders. So Sumitomo Mutsui is one of those in Japan today. And just taking a look at how that stock is trading online, if indeed it is at all. But uh, essentially, bid ask spread is not matching just yet, although we are actually starting to see some live pricing here. We'll just get a track on how that is going so far off about eight tenths of one percent. Uh, but essentially the that is Japan's second biggest bank and it reported an increase in third quarter profit. Let's switch now and take a look at how Korea is faring so far in the session. Again, very correlated to the U.S. In fact, the most correlated market to the U.S. in Asia here. And you are, again, seeing those gains coming through as we see the Nasdaq uh, positioning for further moves higher at the start of trade later. South Korean inflation, one to watch. We saw that slowing more than expected earlier today. So it does just give us further signals that price pressure is starting to cool there, given the BOK, another central bank, of course, that's sticking with tighter policy settings for now. Uh, but Heidi, that is the state of play so far. Australia, uh, one hour into the session. Yeah, take a look at uh, how we are trading here in Australia. This is a picture across the ASX as we uh, get into uh, trading a little bit fully after that staggered start. We're about eight tenths of one percent higher then broadly actually looking like a pretty reasonable session. We're seeing some big gains across real estate in particular. That's up by 2.9 percent technology unsurprisingly following uh, really the highs that we saw uh, for the uh, for of course uh, the, the the big tech names in Wall Street as well up by just about 1.2 percent there. Interestingly, even as we see base metals falling on these concerns over the China slowdown, not to mention going into what is uh, typically a seasonally off-peak session ahead of Lunar New Year holidays, we are actually seeing some of the miners and materials names putting on about 1% as well. Industrials also trading higher. In fact, the only uh, segment to be trading in the red in Australia this morning is uh, utilities there. We're also watching the Aussie dollar holding pretty steady at 65.77, despite quite a bit of weakness uh, in the US dollar overnight. In fact, um, really the largest daily drop this year as we saw that slipping in Treasury yields and renewed concerns about some of those US banks weighing on the greenback. The Aussie dollar is uh, largely unchanged at 65.77. Also watching oil prices there as well. We're seeing some of the uh, oil producers doing quite well in the session here in Sydney, but uh, crude more broadly heading for that weekly drop as talks of that ceasefire in Gaza continue to advance. This is looking like that biggest weekly loss for oil since early November. This could be a crucial step towards ending the conflict, but uh, we are still seeing WTI down almost about 5% for the week there. We're also watching New Zealand uh, trading as well, given that we did see in particular construction coming under pressure uh, with home building consents dropping to a five year low. And that could actually point to more broader economic weakness to come. Also watching treasuries, of course, they really surged uh, as uh, Bell, we saw that bank stock route again, rekindling these hopes when it comes to the Fed easing sooner rather than later. 
Yeah, certainly concerns there resurfacing around a regional banking crisis. But uh, let's bring in our next guest who says that the stocks, stocks in India and Japan have become or could become relatively less attractive over the course of this year. Frank Benzimmer is head of Asia Equity Strategy at Societe Generale and joins us now in the Hong Kong studio. So, Frank, you know, it is a little bit contrarian because we have seen that run up in both of those markets so far this year even. Yes, so that's, uh, uh, that's very interesting uh, what, is, uh, what is happening and uh, what, what, uh, what we are seeing is that if you, uh, if you look at India, we are now back to a 207 valuation mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some part of the market which uh, are really, really overstretched. So it's becoming increasingly difficult to find some decent valuation and this is ha happening at a time where you are going to see the earnings growth to moderate with the fact that the margin are not going to expand or are we going to have more difficulty to expand. So uh, it means we need to be probably a little bit more selective mm. and to have a more cross-asset view, to hold bonds, which are very attractive. And when it comes to the equity market, to probably look at the more international than domestic part of the, of the market. And Japan is a very different story. Mm. The long-term bull driver of corporate governance are here. Uh, inflation expectation back to positive. It is, it is a good thing. But watch the Bank of Japan and the end of the uh, negative interest rate policy and what it means for the yen and then for the profit. So this is where we are tampering a little bit uh, mm -hmm. the enthusiasm that we had last year. Yeah, just talk us through, because I think that is picking up on that point. We have had so much optimism on Japan, notwithstanding a, a dovish BOJ, but it has been more about corporate governance reforms and other factors that are leading more growth drivers as well. So what would you, when you say you're down pairing, just give us sort of more context on that. Yeah, so uh, while well, Japan used to be our top allocation in 2023, it was uh, mm -hmm. like 16 percent of the of the total portfolio. We are reducing the allocation. We are remaining moderately overweight, but uh, we need to be aware that you have some part of the increase came from governance and from real improvement, but another part is coming from the yen and from the boost that has been given to the profit by the weakening yen and this uh, uh, very uh, massive increase in the competitivity of the, of the Japanese corporate. And we, uh, we need to be aware that this part uh, of the increase is going to be much more reduced now that uh, we see some upward pressure coming back on the Japanese yen. Frank, you know, India uh, and, and Japan also have been such popular alternatives to China, right? Is it time to start taking another look at China more selectively? Well, the, 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 the thing about, uh, about China is that uh, there has been this uh, uh, incredible uh, pessimism on, uh, on the market and uh, uh, some form of capitulation that we are seeing uh, through uh, the forward earnings and the, the price to forward earnings, which is now coming to, to nine times, uh, uh, some large outflow from, uh, from foreign investors. And, uh, and, and this is, uh, it, it is creating some, some investment opportunities because uh, you have in this, uh, in this sell-off some good quality company uh, which are being caught in the, in the sell-off. And uh, we, we, we see that the, the, the expectation of a very large stimulus, uh, well, we cannot have too much expectation about that, but we can have some more targeted investment opportunity one of them that uh, uh, we have highlighted is uh, exporter uh, with uh, uh, the trade balance between being between 70 to 80 billion dollar per month uh, it's uh, something quite uh, quite significant and uh, uh, you have uh, a number of firms which uh, which are doing well uh, in uh, in exporting and this is uh, where we see some uh, some investment opportunities and uh, uh, for the market as a whole uh, Given where we are today and the level of expectation, which is extraordinarily low, uh, we can see some tactical bounce <laughs> happening. Right. If you if you keep your expectations low, then maybe you'll uh, you'll get a little bit of upside surprise. Right. Uh, there are still broader risks, though. You think to develop markets from China, particularly if if we see more of a deflationary cycle taking hold. 
Yes, so uh, the, 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 the deflationary pressure is uh, uh, one of the key, uh, key concerns. And uh, uh, it's interesting when we look at uh, the performance by sector in, uh, in China, we had uh, a number of sectors very much uh, uh, impacted by regulatory, ti uh, regulatory tightening, but others doing well. And then those sectors doing well, uh, being very much under pressure in the last 12 months, and this was very much linked to the overcapacity and to, uh, to falling price. So, uh, so there, there is this, uh, this, this kind of, uh, of worries on the, on the deflation coming on the, uh, on the earnings, which is, uh, which is very much impacting the market. But once again, uh, the uh, expectations are very low. Uh, when I look at the momentum of earnings, so how the analysts are revising the earnings, uh, China is the worst. Uh, in, uh, in, in emerging Asia, so uh, at some stage we can see some 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 rebound that uh, that could happen. All right, Frank Benzimra, thanks so much for joining us this morning. That was the head of Asia Equity Strategy at Societe Generale. And let's uh, take a look at some of the movers because we're just bang on 10 minutes into the session so far and taking a look at how Sumitomo Mitsui is faring here because we had its earnings out yesterday after the bell. This is Japan's second biggest bank and it reported an increase in third quarter profit, net income up about 11% on the year earlier, so it just puts it a step closer to meeting its goal for record annual earnings, even though that stock is seeing a little bit of weakness so far. Mizuho as well, we're tracking because it's going to be announcing its earnings later Friday. Uh, analysts really focusing on how it's going to manage its domestic bond portfolio and also its lending spread. So just that question of, I guess, some BOJ policy implications. Let's switch on because the other focus for us so far in the session is on Apple suppliers. Here, these are actually moving mostly to the upside, but that could be also that positive session that we're seeing for tech stocks overall. We've got the Nasdaq pointing to gains at the open, as are U.S. futures here after those some good numbers from big tech. But Apple, really one of those that did disappoint, actually, with its China iPhone sales missing at Target. So dropping around 13% in the final three months of the year, a very crucial holiday quarter as well. And that's what analysts are really clinging to because you're seeing Apple here dropping more than 3%. We're going to have more on Apple's China challenges and the other big tech results just ahead. This is Bloomberg. Take a look at some of the stocks that we're watching after hours. Of course, it is all about big tech, and it was a mixed bag. Better news for Meta and Amazon, less so than what it comes to uh, Apple, of course. But take a look at uh, Meta, still outperforming by over 14 and a half percent. Really, we had that planned 50 billion dollar buyback to try and win over Invest, but also uh, really beating on a number of metrics uh, when it comes to Amazon. We saw profit continuing to grow, and expectations that that will be sustained, but lots of concerns over the weakness in China for Apple. Let's bring Bloomberg Sue Keenan, technology reporter Mark Gurman, and uh, also our Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst Panam Goyal to go through these key earnings. And Mark, uh, let, let's maybe get the, the bad news out of the way first. Like a lot of this uh, sort of downside on Apple is down to the weakness in the China market. Is, is that it though when it comes to Apple? Yeah, the China situation is actually pretty terrible. Uh, we have been bracing for this. Wall Street has been talking about this. Uh, we've been talking about it. Analysts have been talking about it. There's something going on with Huawei in China. Obviously, they've been around for a while, but there seems to be a lot of nationalism, a lot of interest in the Huawei devices uh, at this point. You know, the iPhone took the top spot in terms of market share in China at the tail end of 2023, but they did decline 2%. What about Huawei? Huawei is only a few percentage points behind Apple and market share in China. But something interesting happened. They shot up 36%. So the unit declines that you're seeing from Apple, Oppo, Vivo, the other players in China, those are all going to Huawei sales. So I think Huawei is really at the center of this Apple decline. People in China want that Huawei device. And the iPhone 15 Pro performed so well outside of China that I, overall revenue still went up about 2%. So it's a bit of a bittersweet moment, but maybe less uh, sweet and more bitter given how important China is. 
Uh, Poonam, let's get to, to Amazon and just quickly, why, what really stood out to you from the numbers? I think the operating profit was the biggest surprise and probably the best that we, we've ever seen. So the fact that they could deliver operating profit um, in the quarter and really the fact that it was delivered from better AWS momentum and advertising, we feel that it positions it very well for 2024 to really take profit margins up every year as Amazon continues to build scale across all its major lines of businesses. And we're going to get uh, a little bit more on Meta. Of course, that was sort of the outsized surprise out of that uh, round of earnings there. Sue Keenan, Mark Gurman, and uh, our Bloomberg Intelligence analyst there with us. But we do have a big conversation coming up when it comes to the huge amount of demand for chips that we've seen out of AI. Our very own Ed Ludlow is standing by with the NVIDIA CEO, Ed. Yeah, we welcome Jensen Huang, NVIDIA CEO, to our global output here on Bloomberg Television. And Jensen, the conversation is changing, right, from an AI wave driven by startups like OpenAI to sovereign AI. And you yourself are in Toronto, Canada right now. My understanding is you've just met with a Canadian government official. Uh, what did you agree on? Uh, I met with uh, Minister Champagne, and uh, I'm here. I'm here for several reasons. One, uh, to uh, celebrate the uh, research center that we have here in Toronto. Uh, you probably know that the University of Toronto is is uh, as close to the epicenter of the invention of modern AI as it gets. Uh, Pro Professor Hin was here. Uh, the, the advances in deep learning. Uh, Ilya Suskiver. Uh, was a student, uh, and so I had met many of them uh, in the early days of the of the uh, invention of, of um, uh, modern AI. And so we started our research lab here. Uh, there's there's a there's a large AI community here, and what what is needed is for Canada to have a public infrastructure that supports the ongoing advancement of AI research and to support the local startups and the local industries. Uh, one of the things about generative AI is is a is a form of computer science, a form of computing, where a large computing infrastructure is essential to the creation of the uh, model, the large language model, as well as yes. the generation of the tokens uh, and the and the information that is uh, uh, really valuable that comes out of generative AI. And so, so yes. uh, most of our conversation is around the AI infrastructure necessary in Canada so that Canada could have its own sovereign AI capabilities. You've spoken, Jensen, about the nation state level GPU specialized cloud or sovereign AI specialized cloud. And then we look at what the hyperscalers are doing. You know, you've reflected on that when we talk about H100, we're really talking about HGX server design, right? Or DGX server design. And that ships to the hyperscalers. So, what does this business line where you deal directly with governments and nation states add to what those hyperscalers are already doing in the private sector? Well, as much as as much as possible, um, we should we should uh, utilize use utilize clouds, and uh, it's accessible. Uh, the technology is modern. Uh, our partnership with Microsoft and AWS and GCP um, uh, and other other um, uh, cloud service providers uh, make it make it make the technology accessible uh, so that everybody could could have benefits from it. Um, there are also regional capabilities uh, in each one of the countries that would like to uh, be able to build on this important infrastructure. Artificial intelligence is about the generation of the the generation of tokens in the final analysis. These are numbers that come out of computers that uh, is interpreted as intelligence in each one of the various domains that we serve. And so the 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 production of these tokens, the generation of these tokens require AI supercomputers. And so we have the we have the the technology, the know-how, um, uh, the full stack from uh, the compute networking uh, to the software stack to enable uh, each one of the each one of the countries to be able to build their own AI infrastructure. And so we're we're um, uh, I think you're going to see. Uh, countries around the world be able to uh, continue to use public clouds, uh, but also build regional regional data centers as well as uh, publicly supported um, infrastructure so that each one of the countries could be able to cultivate and advance its own industries. 
uh, Jensen, do the governments that you speak to understand those dynamics? With respect, politics tends to move a lot slower than the rate of technological progress we've seen in just the last 12 months, for example. Well, in fact, in the last 12 months, uh, you, you have seen um, uh, India, Japan, um, uh, France, uh, Canada now, uh, Southeast Asia, Singapore, uh, speak up about the importance of investing in sovereign AI capabilities. Uh, it has uh, become abundantly clear to each one of the countries that, that their natural resource, which is the data of their country, uh, should be, should be um, refined and produce intelligence of their country for their country. And that capability of refining the data of their country, of their country and turn it into their artificial intelligence it is now possible in a in a quite a quite a democratized way. Almost every country should be able to do it for themselves. And and um, what's needed, of course, uh, is the technology and the know-how of standing up AI infrastructure. And that's where we could be uh, quite helpful to to um, uh, various regions. And so I think that the the recognition of the importance of sovereign AI capabilities is now uh, quite quite global. Jensen, does that recognition and, and your ability to help extend to China? You know, on my own show, Bloomberg Technology, the academic community and the startup community reflect that there is a desire at the nation state level to have sovereign AI uh, competency. But there's also a lot of work going on with companies, Baidu as an example. Are you confident that you will be able to work with China on the topic of sovereign AI going forward, given the political backdrop that we live in? Well, we're an American company, and we have to comply with American policies. And um, whatever the rules and regulations are and the laws are, uh, we'll, number one, comply with that. Uh, work closely with the regulators uh, and uh, understand understand uh, their intentions and their desires. Uh, work within those boundaries uh, and uh, be able to create products for, for uh, the various countries that, that um, are involved, fully in compliant with the regulations that, that, are, uh, that are in front of us. Uh, and beyond that, uh, once we once we comply, uh, our goal are, are, and the United States would love to see us be a successful country. And, and, and one of the pillars of national security is successful industries. And uh, it creates jobs um, uh, and uh, uh, allows our country to stay ahead and technologically. And so uh, it, it is of, of a great interest of our nation. Uh, that our American companies are successful around the world. And so once once we comply with the regulations, uh, we'll do our best to serve uh, the, the local markets. And um, uh, we have full, the, 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 we have excellent uh, communications with with our, uh, the administration and we have um, uh, in working in full compliance, uh, be able to serve the local markets and we have the full, full support. Jen, so I go back to that HGX or DGX example, right? We understand how it works with private companies and cloud. Going forward, how should we think about um, sovereign AI as a business line for you? Is there a way that we can understand how NVIDIA's work, even if it's building supercomputers, like in the UK, for example, what proportion of your overall business that will represent if countries are to lead the way? The vast majority of, of uh, the computing market has been United States and um, to a small to a much long, smaller degree China. Um, for the very first time, every industry would be uh, every single country will become a computer industry, and every industry will become a technology industry. And so, artificial intelligence or the automation, uh, the production at scale of of intelligence. Uh, matters to every single country and matters to every single industry. And so, for the very first time, there's a there's a whole new computer market that is going to be uh, in in every single country and every single every single market. And um, uh, it starts with it starts with, of course, uh, uh, the the native computer industry itself. Uh, but you're seeing you're seeing a great adoption in healthcare, great adoption in logistics. Um, uh, in uh, in transportation, of course, uh, in manufacturing, in the large industries, the heavy industries, uh, for the very first time, because of generative AI, computers are going to be computer technology is going to impact 
uh, literally every single industry in every single country. And so, so the markets are going to be quite large and global. Jensen, our final question comes from our audience, actually. I said that you were coming on, and I think you'll appreciate this one. And, and it relates to sovereign AI, but, it, but it's how AI impacts all of us. And this user asks, Ray Kurzweil's prediction that human-level intelligence in AI will be achieved by the end of this decade, does Jensen believe that that trajectory and timeline is on track? Well, uh, you know, AGI from an engineer's perspective requires requires specification, and um, uh, if if uh, AGI specification was a a, um, a collection of tests that humans are able to perform, and until now, no computers can, and that that suite of tests, uh, whether it's math or English or um, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, it could be uh, law tests, it could be, uh, uh, you know, medical, uh, whatever whatever the tests are, if that suite of tests could be specified, uh, could be put in front of generative AI uh, over the course of, of, of the next, uh, you know, within this decade, my, my, my guess would be uh, that at the rate of the current progress, it is very likely that that suite of tests would be achieved uh, by a computer. However, uh, there, there are much larger uh, definitions of, of uh, human general intelligence, and and uh, until we're able to specify what that means or even understand what that means, uh, it's going to be very hard to know whether we've achieved it or not. But but the the, the definition that I provided, which is the uh, the ability for a computer to, to achieve excellent results um, on a suite of tests that uh, previously were given to human. Uh, that suite of tests, I think, within the decade, will be uh, achieved by computers, and and generative AI will be uh, would be a tool that could be used in a, a large field of science and uh, many fields. Right. The industries and uh, uh, Nvidia CEO Jensen Huang. I know I've got to let you go. This is Bloomberg. Taking a look at one very big mover in the session today. This is Alzora. It's a Japanese small lender. And yesterday it was off more than 20% in the session. So just seeing this drop here again of more than 17% is really significant when you put it in that context. Now, uh, this is actually the steepest two day drop we've seen for the company since it turned public. Uh, again, just a bit more context there. What exactly has happened here is that uh, Alzora essentially made a really big bet on US commercial property. So as I said, it's a small lender. It was struggling to compete with the mega banks in Japan. It lacked that well-defined customer base of regional lenders. So about 10 years ago, it decided to expand aggressively overseas to the point where nearly a third of its lending was outside of the country. And a lot of that was going on to U.S. commercial real estate. Now it's flagging the huge losses that are coming from that. And this is the market reaction that's really telling. Uh, but Heidi, really, just a lot of markets, a lot of movers that, that are driving the session dynamics so far. Yeah, a lot of dynamics, and of course, you know, the two major ones that we're seeing at the moment is the that the currents of some of these stocks that are being moved by the big tech story, right? Apple suppliers are watching most cleanly, given just the, the the really wealth of issues, not just the China slowdown story, but perhaps something a bit more existential when it comes to the product cycle and overall demand for the iPhone. And of course, we're still watching to see if this uh, latest kind of episode of the U.S. banking stress might actually change the timing when it comes to the Fed. That's certainly what some parts. Of the markets uh, are contending with at the moment. But that rebound in U.S. equities is extending into this Friday session here in Asia. We're seeing Japan stocks up by just about half a percent there. The cost be accelerating 1.3 percent higher, of course. When it comes to uh, South Korea CPI, that is now pretty much within that target range, right? Easing much more than expected. Some concerns are lingering. We know that the BOK Governor Rhee is uh, really making inflation uh, his, his core priority at the moment. Whether that kind of moves the needle for the BOK's uh, policy going forward, it would be one important aspect to watch there. Aussie stocks are up by just about 1%. And in fact, just about every single sector is trading in the green here in Australia, even materials and miners, as we see that uh, declining base metals and as we get into this kind of pretty sensitive off-peak period for Chinese demand as well, that's not a concern for traders today, Bill. 
Yeah, Heidi. And really, if there's one mover that's that's standing out so far in the session, that's Meta and After Hours because it's absolutely popping. Uh, let's get more details on that now and bring back Sue Keenan in New York. And Sue, this is really coming down to a banner quarter for the company. Yeah, absolutely. One analyst called it spectacular. Plans for an additional multi-billion dollar share back, buyback, a first ever dividend, and the numbers just incredible. Meta Platforms posted a 25% gain in sales, profits more than tripled, and the revenue outlook for the current quarter beat estimates. As much as $37 billion is what they're looking at for the current quarter versus estimates of $33.6 billion. No wonder shares were up as much as 15%. And that's after gaining 12% so far this year. Now, the first quarterly dividend is a surprise and a big deal. You have to remember 2023 was what Zuckerberg called the year of efficiency, a lot of cut up backs, layoffs. It was a shaky 18 months. So this, along with the share buyback, appears to be a signal the company doing well enough to give back. Uh, daily active users way up. Going forward, Meta will not be focused on this metric, however. Important to point out that Zuckerberg called it a good quarter and said, quote, we've made a lot of progress on our vision for advancing AI and the metaverse in advertising Meta, which owns Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, fared a lot better than Alphabet it's Google, which disappointed with its results. They both get the bulk of their revenue from digital ads and heavily invest in AI. Notably, CFO Susan Lee said the strong increase in fourth quarter revenue was due to heavy spending by China-based advertisers and, as well, uh, AI-recommended video content. But on China, they said in 2023, revenue from China-based advertisers represented 10 percent of Meta's total revenue. So that's a pretty strong statistic there. So what's being seen as the biggest challenges then for Meta going forward? Well, one top analyst I spoke with before the earnings came out said the biggest overhang for Meta has got to be the regulatory issues. There's still a lot of headwinds. And in fact, on the analyst call, Meta said it is now going to be challenging a modification of an existing consent order by the Federal Trade Commission, or FTC. Uh, they said that this substantial modification could impose additional restrictions that make it uh, hard for them to operate. So without providing detail, they say they're going to challenge this. If unsuccessful, they say these expected changes could have an adverse effect. As you know, Meta remains under pressure to rein in harmful content across all of its platforms. Just yesterday, CEO Mark Zuckerberg was in the hot seat in front of Washington lawmakers, grilled in a congressional hearing over the alarming rise in online child sex abuse material. In fact, Zuckerberg rose uh, to face family members seated behind him of children who had suffered online abuse to offer an apology. Uh, that said, more people are using Meta services than ever before. The company has close to 4 billion users across its apps each month. That's a 6 percent increase from a year ago. And again, analysts say it is now becoming the dominant media platform in most of the emerging world. So if you want to bet on the emerging world going forward, uh, this remains a very a strong bet. Uh, analysts very bullish on these results. Back to you. For the next day, Keenan, there with the latest on Meta and some of the other corporate stories that we're following. The Wall Street Journal says Intel is delaying the construction timetable for its $20 billion chip making project in Ohio. The report cites sources saying construction isn't expected to finish until late 2026. Intel had initially targeted chip production in 2025, with the plan also dependent on US government grant money. Wall Street banks, including JP Morgan and Bank of America, are said to be in talks to provide as much as $8 billion in financing for a buyout of DocuSign. Sources say Jefferies and Deutsche Bank are also among the lenders considering a role. Bank Capital and Hellman and Friedman are jockeying to buy the platform in what could be the largest leverage buyout of the year so far. Universal Music has begun pulling music from TikTok after months of contract negotiations with the app's owner, ByteDance, failed. The label is home to artists including Taylor Swift and Drake. Universal says the rights offer was below market value, but TikTok calls that a false narrative. The label also says TikTok's adoption of AI tools to generate content is a major threat to artists. 
Shares in Deutsche Bank rose after it announced plans for a $733 million share buyback and detailed cuts to 3,500 jobs. The reductions will affect mostly back office roles and are part of cost-cutting measures that the company had previously announced. We have focused our efforts on, on what we call non-client facing yeah. staff, um, where, where there's been a significant change over the last several years around internalization of, of activities, the control investments that we've made, the investments in technology. Um, and so having reached a level of maturity in, in, in some, some of these areas, I think the, the goal now is to drive efficiency without losing effectiveness. So yes, that's where, where the, the, the staff cuts are, are targeted. All right, let's get back to Japan earnings now because we've got uh, Japan Airlines delivering its results later Friday with hopes of profit support from lower jet fuel prices. For more, let's bring in our Asia Transport reporter, Danny Lee, and uh, just talk us through firstly what we're expecting out of these numbers later. Yeah, so we're expecting 435 billion yen in revenue, and that should be hovering around a quarterly record. So that's a pretty good sign, robust demand there from sales and higher ticket prices. But then we're also expect to see 20 billion yen of uh, net income. But what we are looking closely is, will they raise its guidance? What will the full year profit outlook look like? Because ANA, its biggest rival, All Nippon Airways, had earnings Wednesday, and they raised that. And so, will Japan Airlines fall into line with that? And also, it's just generally falling into line with international airlines in general, having raised that outlook earlier. But we are going to be uh, seeing earnings today on the one-month anniversary of the Japan Airlines crash that happened in Tokyo Haneda Airport. Uh, last month and so one extra thing I'll be close looking out for is what does this mean for uh, you know, future kind of earnings and because the impact potentially from customers who may have been reluctant to travel the airline had actually uh, offered much flexibility uh, for passengers who didn't want to travel at the time so will there be any impact after that obviously a uh, third quarter for third quarter earnings happened uh, prior to that accident. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about A and A? What was the focus for you? Um, so for a a they had a pretty good set of uh, numbers overall, and as Japan's biggest carrier, um, they, they really uh, overshot on, on estimates. But this is the backdrop of uh, you know, tourism, foreign tourism numbers coming back to pre-pandemic levels. This has been a boon for the Japanese carriers in general. But on the flip side, you have domestic citizens, uh, more like um, Japanese citizens rather, uh, with the, that, that stronger yen that hasn't failed to materialize yet, the weaker yen overall you know destroying that 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 spending power for uh for citizens you know this is something where it's dragging on on airlines uh like the japanese carriers who you know don't see that that demand uh balance equaling out and so this is something that if the if the yen can strengthen obviously the boj is very much in focus here then it will help uh, earnings ever more our Asia Transport reporter Danny Lee there. We'll come up next. Hong Kong leader John Lee's decision to enact a domestic security law risks undermining efforts to revitalize the city's business. We get the details next. This is Bloomberg. The Bank of England has opened the door to rate cuts for the first time since the pandemic, affirming predictions that inflation will fall to target in the coming months. But Governor Andrew Bailey says the central bank is watching key factors that may cause price pressures to re-emerge. I think we've now changed the question, really, from how restrictive do we need to be to for how long do we need to be restrictive. That's important. We've also taken the upside bias off. We have included a risk, by the way, a new risk, actually, which is we're really reflecting, obviously, sort of tragic events in the Middle East and the impact that can have through the, the Red Sea effects. Um, so I think now the question is for us is really is for how long do we need to maintain this stance going forwards? As I, you know, I've said a number of times, we're not, going, you know, we're not making predictions at this point. Um, we're, we're setting up the framework. 
the things that we think are important to look at really haven't changed, actually. So services, inflation, aspects of the labor market, you know, the domestic drivers of inflation, because these global shocks, I think you know, we're now seeing the disinflation side of the global shocks. But Governor, is there a, sp a specific, is it wage growth? Is there something specific in the set of numbers that you look at that will give you the impetus to cut? Well, I think a number of things. I mean, services inflation, I mean, it's still at 6.4%, so it's still you know, well above anything that you know, I would say is consistent with us consistently meeting the target, first of all. I think with wage growth, we have seen the official measure come down. It's below where we thought it would be. Open question, really, as to whether that was a sort of bit of an adjustment of some anomalies in that index, or whether that really is you know, a, a, a move. But it doesn't. It's now in line with the other things we look at. Again, yeah, you know, they're above, frankly, levels that are consistent with with hitting the target. But I think the important thing there is to say, look, you know, inflation has come down a long way. Headline inflation. I would, and it's going, we think it's going to come down further in the short. Is that thanks to the Bank of England policy? Well, I think well. Two things there. First of all, I think the, ma it's, it's the major driver of that is the disinflation side of the global shocks. What Bank of England policy has done, and I've been saying this some time, I think, is to prevent it becoming domestically embedded, tend to call the second round effects. That's what, and, and we always said that's what we can do. We can't stop global shocks. You know, I wish, obviously, we all wish we could stop wars, but we can't in that sense through monetary policy. So you know, our job is to stop it becoming embedded. That was the BOE Governor Andrew Bailey speaking to Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. And let's uh, take a look at what we're seeing in the commodity space so far. Of course, very sensitive to rate expectations. But uh, oil here, you can see, just moving a little bit higher. It was a pretty choppy session on Thursday. Uh, and actually, oil heading for its biggest weekly loss since early November. That's as we really track the latest geopolitical developments, and particularly, of course, what's happening in the Middle East. And a Hamas official says the group is still considering a proposal to pause the war with Israel. Israel and free civilian hostages. The plan for a 45-day truce was presented after talks in Paris last weekend between officials from Qatar, Egypt, the US and Israel. Sources close to the negotiations say the deal has a realistic chance of success, but a breakthrough could still take several days. EU leaders have clinched a deal on a $54 billion financial aid package for Ukraine after Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban lifted his veto. Ukraine says it's grappling with a shortage of weapons to fend off the Russian military, with $60 billion in U.S. aid stalled in Congress. President Zelensky's office, meanwhile, has denied reports that he fired his top general, who then refused to step down. In Hong Kong, plans for new security legislation is creating fresh anxiety in the finance hub and could undermine the city's efforts to revitalize the business environment. For more, let's bring in Asia government and economy correspondent Rebecca Chung-Wilkins. And Rebecca, yeah, I mean, I think Chief Executive Lee has really been sort of trying to, to wage a, a path for the city over the past year or so and convincing investors and, and, and people to return to the city. Is this just a, a step back or, or what's the sense so far on this, this possible legislation? Well, I think among the business community, there is sort of a somewhat degree of concern and uh, around the uncertainty of precisely over how this is going to be implemented. And there are a couple of points that sort of keep coming up in conversations that I, I'm having with people. Um, one is on this idea of the widened definition of state secrets. The language there essentially mirrors the language that is present in mainland China's national security framework and potentially could touch on issues uh, that lead to sort of around the socio-economic development of the city, anything that, you know, reveals some kind of private information on that point. So that has created a little bit of, of uncertainty, precisely how far that could go. There are sort of, of course, folks who are a bit more sanguine, you know, people who are used to dealing with those constrictions in mainland China already. For example, they're talking on a daily basis to their colleagues across, uh, you know, ac across the border. They're used to figuring out how to manage that. They're a bit more accustomed to it. Um, so there's sort of two, two sort of feelings, I would say. Uh, how much does this potentially create, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the bedrock for more conflict, right, more geopolitical tensions if there's any pushback? 
Yeah, this is another sort of certainly interesting element to it. So we do have this extraterritorial element. And the fear here is that this could inflame geopolitical tensions if, for example, Hong Kong were to pursue um, someone that was a citizen of another country, say a U.S. citizen uh, in the U.S. And that is a, of a sort of prag practical concern here because we have seen these pro-democracy uh, uh, activists going into essentially sort of self-imposed exile. Think of Agnes Chow uh, going to Canada, for example. And, of course, we have these bounties, a, a, Hong, a Hong Kong, one million Hong Kong dollar bounty on several different activists overseas already. I think more broadly, I think the concern is that while on the one hand, uh, you know, John Lee and the government has really tried to go out and project Hong Kong, uh, that it's sort of business as usual here. Everything is going on as normal. And it is, of course, Asia's world city. On the other hand, they have also got to sort of proceed with all of these uh, national security measures that are in some ways just sort of step in line with the Beijing's, with Beijing's agenda uh, that we've also seen kind of increasingly focus more to security. Right. But that balance is very difficult because it seems like just one after the other, sort of this relentless stream of news focused on national security. And, you know, for most part, foreign firms just want the Hong Kong government and, in fact, perhaps the U.S. government too, to just stop talking about this. It's, it's certainly a hard news flow to, to have to contend with. Right? Rebecca Chung Wilkins, our Asia government and economy correspondent there in Hong Kong. Uh, we do have more to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Qualcomm is expecting a modest recovery for the smartphone processor industry in 2024. CEO Cristiano Amon told Bloomberg Technology that the adoption of AI is exciting, but that the timing is hard to predict. First of all, I don't understand where this inventory commentary is really coming from. We saw this, I think, uh, in the press yesterday. Maybe I'll use this opportunity to explain. Uh, the majority of our business, Hansis, we're working very hard to diversify the business, we're making good progress, but still the majority of the business handsets. And hence, as we have seen that inventory had actually stabilized since last quarter. I think what we see in the results, especially with the uh, beat and raise uh, in EPS, is that Hensys are getting back to normal. We're happy with the health of the Android ecosystem. Uh, premium tier, it's strong with HN3, and we still see that in the numbers. IoT, we talk about industrial inventory actually before every other company. Actually, we were some of the first ones to talk about it. Uh, it's still a smaller percent of our business. We'd like it to be bigger, but we had said that that is the lowest quarter, and we expect to see uh, growth in the coming quarters. So, yeah, I, I don't understand uh, this uh, comment on inventory. We're happy with the results, and we have happy with a number of the analyst revisions that actually came out this morning on the stock. I'm just reading the, the transcript from the earnings call, right? And, and you said second half of the fiscal year, as we see the inventory kind of normalizing in the IoT context. A, a positive area was China. You promised that we would get an uptick in China sales. We did get that. Does it reflect customers in China having been through inventories, or is this a commitment to forward ordering, signs that those end markets have demand? Yes, uh, this is a great question. And I want to start by saying we have two vectors that are very encouraging. One vector is the premium tier has proven to be resilient, even within the uh, macro uncertainty. And it shows that users, when they go buy the next phone, they want a better phone. The second thing is we're starting to see the first innings of Gen AI. Some of the use cases are starting to come in, and that has brought some excitement. Uh, some of our customers had record uh, pre-sales of their new devices with HN3. And what we see in China right now, I think there was a lot of concern in the past about Huawei coming back to the phone business. But what's exactly happening is Huawei is increasing the size of the TAM, uh, and our customers are holding share and seeing opportunities in the premium tier, and that's reflected in the quarter. We have a lot of orders of HN3, especially for phones that launch or are launching in the market. We're happy. We're just cautiously optimistic since we don't know how this 
second half of the year in phones in China is going to unfold. Cristiano, how do you navigate geopolitics when it comes to China, not just macroeconomy? We just do business. I think we focus on what we can control. I think we're happy that we have a strong relationship with China. Our technology is differentiated and is helping, I think, uh, both sides. One, it's, uh, it's business, it's export of semis for the U.S., for China. It has been growth for technology. We have not been impacted to date by any of the restrictions. And as we diversify the company going from handsets to automotive and industrial, I think we see our China business expanding as well. Well. All right, taking a look at how we're setting up with futures here because US ones are pointing to further gains ahead of the open. Busy day for Wall Street earnings. Meta, one of the ones that's really jumping in after hours. Uh, China futures as well pointing to some gains here and just about 30 minutes out from the open. Uh, something on the central bank here, the PBOC saying it provided $20.9 billion worth of low-cost funds for lending to housing and infrastructure projects last month. The Pledge Supplemental Lending Program is a tool for Beijing to manage the worst of its property downturn. What do you consider to be the biggest challenge? Infrastructure that supports trade is, is the biggest challenge. Um, our senior brother, President Adeshin of the AFDB, estimates the, 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 the annual deficit, infrastructure deficit in Africa to be over $100 billion. But that hundred, over $100 billion is actually also an opportunity for investment. Uh, so it is a massive, a significant challenge that we are confronting and my um, my fear is that we may succeed in establishing a, a very effective legal construct and a very effective legal foundation for trade liberalization and investment liberalization in Africa but all of that will come to to naught if the, the infrastructure deficit is not addressed uh, because you will need the goods to move somehow and you will need to have uh, good trade corridor connectivity, uh, ports, uh, trade corridors that connect uh, uh, countries that are landlocked to right. the ports. You're a famous photographer, you're a conservationist, you're an activist. How would you define yourself? I think I'm just a human trying to figure out how to be a better steward of our little planet. I am a biochemical engineer by training. I studied marine biology, fisheries, aquaculture. And then I realized that the ocean is very much out of sight and it needs help. And so I became a photographer to be able to communicate with a larger audience. And thank goodness I was good at it. When, when did you realize that actually photography was your passion and you could make a real difference to our world? You know, I didn't start out as being a photographer, so it was not until 1990-something, 90 96, when I picked up a camera and I became a professional photographer soon after. And it's one of those things 